Zoom stuff. Hello there. Hi. Hi. I've got Dan Morheim to talk about his new book called The Better End. Dan Morheim is an emergency physician, a medical administrator, a legislator, and a writer and a thinker. So we're going to talk about his new book. And Dan, welcome. Uh, great to be with you, Tyler. So you're an emergency medicine physician. You're a legislator. legislator. What made you decide to spend so much time and to focus so much energy on death and dying? Well, the new book, Preparing for a, a Better End, Expert Lessons, um, is really comes right out of my experience as a practicing emergency medicine physician, but then I also was a Maryland state legislator for 24 years. And, and it really began as an ER doctor when I found myself in the uh, uncomfortable position of doing things to patients that I knew really wasn't the right thing to do. Um, and that, that involved what you see on TV is full codes, full CPR. Uh, in TV, it works out much better than in real life. And it got me thinking about patient empowerment and patient values and respect for what people really want uh, when they have choices and informed. And since we're 100% of us apparently are going to die, we, we can, we're the first generation in human history that likely has some say about how that happens. And that's a powerful and empowering concept. I translated some of that into my life as a legislator and then um, got enough activity that I decided to write uh, this book. But you know, no one in the ER wants to talk about death and dying. They want to talk about what you're going to do to save them. No one in the legislature wants to spend time, except for you, on how do we organize the information so we know who has it and where it is. Mm -hmm. um, what is the right time to talk about death and dying? There, there is always, it's always the right time. But you know, it's like other things in our culture that have been, in effect, kind of topics we don't talk about, but have become more comfortable. I mean, I'm thinking back to when Betty Ford first talked about breast cancer. Uh, what a big step that was. Ronald Reagan wrote about his uh, struggles with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, people are more comfortable talking about a family member who maybe has substance abuse, but problems. Uh, I have a, one of my kids has adult children has epilepsy and that's a difficult thing also. But you know, when people start talking about it, they feel better. They want to talk about this. And let me just say, as an elected official, I won six elections and I was out in the community talking about a whole range of issues and, and bringing this up too. And sometimes people said, that's not really a great way to get votes. But what I found was everybody in, in community meetings, you know, has had these experiences. They're dealing with it with themselves, with their family, their spouses, their parents, their grandparents. And they would come up to me afterwards and say, thank you so much for bringing up the subject of how to manage values and care at end of life because I'm dealing with it and there's no place else to talk about it. No one's talking about it. So thank you for talking about it. And by the way, I'm going to vote for you now. <laughs> so it actually worked out uh, well. So what is the background or the expertise needed to get into these discussions? Is everybody competent and qualified to make all these decisions and to come to conclusions? I think everybody is, I'm, I'm speaking here of the population, adult population, everybody over the age of 18. Advanced directives, advanced care planning are legal documents. They're essentially free, uh, available in every state and they've been around since 1991. We did a study when I was on the faculty at the Hopkins School of Public Health. We found that only 40% of American adults had completed these, maybe 35%. And it was about half that in the minority population. In the study, we also asked people uh, if you don't have one, which is 60 to 70% of the people we're talking to, would you like one? And overwhelmingly, they said yes. 90% said yes. So 90% of 60% is 50%, meaning that the adult population wants to be involved in this, and, but they aren't. And so the challenge is to get people to move. And, and we've seen these changes. I mean, I, I remember in the legislature when we passed the bill to stop smoking in restaurants was a big deal. Now we don't fuss about that. Um, this is something that we're on a curve and people will be more comfortable as they understand it better and realize this is really a good thing and an empowering thing for them. Let me push a little bit more because everybody who turns 18 should have an advanced directive so their family knows what they want, but what should people turn to for their answers? Do they turn to science? Do they turn to religion? Do they turn to family tradition? What is the, the basic knowledge or basic experience necessary for someone to address the issue? Well, all the things you just mentioned actually are 
are perfectly appropriate. Uh, in our study, we did ask people where you would like to get information, and we, we ran the gamut from faith-based, medical, attorney, family members, culture, and they were all represented. But the highest one by far was talking to your own healthcare provider, your primary care physician or nurse practitioner, whoever you go to. So I think it's something that people want to have a conversation with their primary care uh, provider. Uh, unfortunately, providers are, are, are awkward themselves talking about this because it forces everybody to confront their own mortality. But I, let, me, let me put the, the question this way. Consider that we're, you just have to accept we're all gonna die. Where would you like to be in the last days, hours, minutes of your life? Where are you physically? Who's around you? What's going on? That's a five second mental exercise. And I've done this with hundreds of audiences and everybody and I'm, says the same thing. I would like to be at home pain-free with my family around me. Nobody says killed in a fiery car crash. Nobody says shot in a drive-by. Nobody says uh, tied to machines long after hope and recovery in an intensive care unit with my family down the hall. Nobody says those things. Now I want the best that medical science has to offer. If I'm in a car accident today or get chest pain, I wanna to go to the hospital and get the best of all medical care. But if and when the end is really becoming clear and it's apparent, I wanna be at home, comfortable with my family. And that's what this is about. It provides the best of what modern medical science has that you and I as physicians embrace and enjoy. And at the same time recognizes that there comes a time and you can get the best of both worlds. So where is the link between thinking about death and dying and legislation? What's the government's role versus the individual role? And where does the legislate, legislature come in? Well, the, most le, le, legislatures around the United States have already acted. These documents are legal in every um, state. And, that, and there, there are good online ones. Like my, I personally like mydirectis.com. There are others, but that, they're free and online. Um, legislature has taken action. We created MULS forms, which is another medical orders for life-sustaining treatment. That's another version of an advanced directive. Um, we passed in Maryland at any rate and around the country, many places have passed National Healthcare Decisions Day, April 16th, tied to April 15th is taxes, April 16th is the other part of that equation national, to, to raise awareness, but not much, and, and we've created uh, laws that allow for electronic advance directives, but fundamentally this boils down to individual people taking the action because it's not government or your, your clergy person or your congressman or your spouse who's gonna complete your advanced directive, look in the mirror. That's the person that can complete it. And you can change an advanced directive anytime you want. You can update it however you like. So as your situation changes, what you'll do when you're 18 or 28 or 38 or 58 or 88, it's gonna vary. Your relationships may change, beliefs may change, health conditions will change. So it's a fluid document, it can be updated. But there isn't that much more legislatively that needs to be done. We can add some things that make it more uh, available and easy, but really this boils down to people taking control of their own situation. Well, one of the places where I think we may see some movement in the future is who keeps them and who holds on to them? Because CRISP now has centralized electronic medical records. So we don't have centralized um, advanced directives or an easy access to them for all patients. So I think we're getting there. I don't know if it's where it should be. Yeah, that, that, that's a, a fair point. And, and there is work to do that. CRISP is the, in, in the mid-Atlantic region is the entity that shares electronic medical records among institutions. And it's very useful in that regard. They should have a slot in there for advanced directives and eventually they will. One of the things I like about my directives actually is I, I, I can print my, um, advanced directive form, which not only includes the advanced directives, but other things about preferences um, onto a QR code, which I carry with me in my wallet and in the glove compartment of my car. So if I'm taken to the emergency room, suddenly uh, the emergency physicians can scan that and get access, not only to my, my advanced directive information, contact information for my family, my health insurance information, the medicines that I take and other information that ought to be readily available. More important now in COVID than ever, because families often, often aren't often at the bedside. And you and I know as clinicians, we often rely on families to tell us about the patient uh, at times when the patient can't fully communicate for themselves. One other thing about advanced directives is important to note, they only become operative when you can't make decisions about your own care. You can make decisions about your own care 
the document sits to the side. It's when you can't, maybe you're going in for major surgery or maybe you've had a stroke and are unable to communicate for a while or some other condition or severe dementia. That's when this becomes operative. Well, I think your book is a, does a terrific job of raising the issues and walking you through thinking about what you need to think about and the decisions you need to make. I wanted to ask more of a fun question about that though, because the first edition you wrote by yourself, the second edition has a new co-author by the name of Shelley Morheim, yes. a well-known writer, filmmaker, organizer, just a logical, thoughtful person. Why did you add her as a co-author? Well, my wife, and uh, she is just a terrific writer and editor. And actually we have a good collaborative uh, arrangement. I, 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 I'm pretty good at generating a lot of words on a page, but they're not as well organized and uh, well-written as I would like. She can take that and fix it. And then we go back and forth a few times. So she was very involved in the first book. Um, and so it seemed very reasonable to involve her on the second book and put her on the, uh, on the cover. She is a lawyer. She doesn't practice, but she does have legal training. So that helped. But she also uh, plays the harp at a local hospital for patients as a therapeutic music practitioner. And so that gave another perspective that she, she brought to it. But it's a collaborative effort, um, that, fundamentally from my point of view. But, uh, you know, you got a good life partner, you, you take advantage of it. Absolutely. And another nice thing about the book is you, you raise the points and stories. You started the first uh, edition with the story of Alberta Cole, who hadn't had advanced directives and how that affected her end of life care and where she went. Um, how does that, uh, some of those stories bring up the interface between individuals and the healthcare system. Um, so do you think that's getting better, getting worse? Are those issues working themselves out or in more need of direction? I don't want to make a generalization about people interacting with the healthcare system. The point of the book, however, is to empower you to better deal with the healthcare system once you're caught up in it, because it is a system, a lot of good people, a lot of caring, but it is a system and it tends to sometimes do things. You know, if you haven't expressed your own wishes, things will happen to you. So the default is, do you want to let the system make decisions, maybe a committee, people who don't know you or where you can influence it and shift the likelihood to what you want is what this book is really about. And so that's, uh, and, and the stories are all real. Um, the names are changed and some circumstances are changed. So they're not that identifiable, but these are, the stories are really about kinds of things that happen to people. And then I lay out the options. How would you like to manage a situation if you were suffered from um, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. What would you want? What if you had uh, some serious terminal disease? What if uh, a loved one did? How, how would you feel? Here's some of the choices that uh, might be there. And also things like pain management. Um, how do you want your, here's some options on pain management. Um, disp you know, disposition of your body. Do you want natural burial, uh, uh, cremation, and the pros and cons of each. Cremation, by the way, very uh, unfriendly to the environment. Uh, not a good way to go, in my opinion, uh, but there are other options. There are more and more natural burial uh, options where people are put in the ground in, in, in a biodegradable casket and uh, this money is spent on a ceremony or other things rather than expensive funerals. So there's a lot of different kinds of other things and there are also organ donation, the gift of life. And I remember hearings in Annapolis on organ donation in 2008 when I was in the legislature revamped the Maryland, entire Maryland organ donation laws, which has spawned the programs and boosted the programs at Johns Hopkins and at the University of Maryland because the legislation redid the structure. And, you know, you see what, there were people who, you know, were sitting next to each other or, or one of them was the recipient of a the heart of, the, of a family member, the person sitting next to them. And it was so moving. Um, those kinds of things are also covered in the book and, you, you know, something for people to consider seriously because they can give a gift of life. One of the nice things about the books is <coughs> about choosing the care you want as opposed to choosing the death you want, where the decisions were based on how you want to be treated. And I think hospice has also entered that space where they help you make choices on individual aspects of your care as opposed to talking only about dying. Absolutely, and hospice and palliative care are covered in the book and I would and make two points about both. So hospice, 
um, you're entitled to six months, without going too much detail, six months of hospice care. But on average, people only use 20 days. We pay for hospice care through Medicare, that is our taxes. So apart from all the services they provide, uh, taking care of people, taking care of families, and all the skilled uh, folks that, that, that work in this, you've paid for six months of service, and you're only getting 20 days. So I'd argue financially... <laughs> I tell people, if you get a bad diagnosis, if I got a bad diagnosis, I would call hospice now, even if I was five years away from uh, facing that. And palliative care, also there have been studies that show that palliative care, a great study in the New England Journal, two groups of people with advanced lung cancer, some got palliative care early, some didn't. The ones who got palliative care uh, lived longer, had more, uh, were happier in their lives and spent less money. So from a financial, personal, spiritual perspective, um, these kinds of services, in the past, uh, these kinds of services are really valuable. In the past, they've sort of been like, well, we don't know what else to do. We're gonna throw in the towel, we'll call these folks, the hospice and palliative care teams. I think that's old thinking. I think new thinking is let's get those folks involved early, just like you get involved any, with any specialist if you have a really complicated problem or a unique situation and take advantage. These services are there to help people and they do a great job. And, uh, you know, I would, I've seen hospice work with some of my own family members and, it, and close friends, and it's been really excellent hospice and palliative care. So that's, that's a change too. And I would encourage people to do that. And that's in the book as well. One of the unique aspects about end of life care is that we don't have one right answer. There's a wide range of desires and people often choose widely differing types of care and pathways. Do you think there is going to eventually with time will come to one pathway and one algorithm for end of life care, or is it going to remain individual? I think it's individual and, be, and there's also cultural differences. And I go into that as well into the, the book where diverse culture, diverse religions, diverse faiths, and uh, I, you can have those respected um, by completing the advanced directive the way you want. So I hope first people complete them. Secondly, don't hide it. It shouldn't be like in a safety deposit box. This needs to be available. Give it to the people who you've designated as your healthcare agent if you can't make decisions. Um, and then uh, clinicians, we need to learn to honor them. We don't do a really good job of that yet either. But let me also just shift for a moment because you can't talk about healthcare without talking about medicine. And I, want, I wrote about in the book, Look, the, the La Crosse, Wisconsin uh, uh, effort. So a number of years ago, La Crosse, Wisconsin, which is a town, bigger metropolitan area of 150,000 people, decided that they would make the conversation about end of life care normative, which it should be. It's not like you dwell on it a lot, but just get it over with once. And what they, they raised their rate of completion of advanced directives from about 30% to 98% employing the faith community, the legal community, the medical community, and the business community. And what they found was not only were families happier, the community more integrated, spiritual dimensions respected, they drastically reduced their healthcare costs as, uh, and as end of life care. Medicare, which pays for a lot of this, is about an $800, $900 billion program. About $300 billion is in the last months of life. If you can reduce that by 10%, because people don't want to die in an intensive care unit unless it's absolutely essential for them to be there. We ask people, everybody prefers to die at home as established. Um, you save a lot of money. Every day out of a hospital uh, is, is money saved when it's the right thing to respect the person's wishes. So typically in healthcare, we reduce healthcare costs by making a system that's so complicated. We don't pay providers. We put burdens on employers. We increase co-pays and deductibles. Here's a way to save a lot of money in healthcare by respecting people's wishes. It makes a lot of sense. It, it does make sense. And in healthcare, we often say prevent death at all costs, but our real goal is to prevent death that's preventable and give people life. And, and those are the decisions where there's a default that we don't address. And the default is do everything, keep people alive. And it's the high tech um, alternative that really doesn't have an end point that we've all agreed upon. It's just deferring decisions until um, they no longer need to be made. Well, what we're trying to provide, and I think what, what clinicians are coming around and what the book certainly says to do is we can't prolong your life indefinitely, but we can provide hope. 
Hope that you'll be comfortable. Hope that you, you'll feel connected with your family. Um, hope that you won't feel abandoned when you get uh, to the point of serious advanced illness. Hope that you can uh, have things managed comfortably in a way that suits your particular set of values and orientation. That's a really powerful concept. No generation in human history has had that, those set of options before. We're the first generation in human history that likely has some say about how we die. And when you reflect on that, it's a really powerful uh, concept. The other thing I think that we, you, you and I both experience as clinicians, but probably in our personal life, you know, a lot of uh, folks said to, you know, I, I, I got cancer and it made me appreciate life more. I wouldn't have wanted the cancer. I wouldn't have wanted this terrible disease, but, but I really appreciate the, um, that, that it's made me value the people in my life and love them and, 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 and be more sensitive to the little things. Uh, I think one of the things the book tries to get across is that this exercise, which is just a little bit of your time, not a huge amount, is, is gonna help you appreciate life. This, goal, this wonderful gift we have, uh, it's precious because it is temporary. Uh, there's no changing that, but we can do better in all the things that we do and, and just complete some free paperwork. It takes 15 minutes. You might not think about it for, I have to think about it for a while, but really the actual act of completing advanced directive takes 15 minutes. And you're right, thinking about these issues really does help you value what you have and, and what you're doing with it. Another question for you about the book is who is the target audience? Well, the target audience is everybody over the age of 18. And if you're mortal, if you're immortal, you're not, you don't need to read this book for everybody else. And by the way, it's not just for old people. Uh, the three most famous cases in American legal history were women under 30. And senior citizens, people at my age, we, we recognize that there's less life ahead of us than behind us. And you know, you start thinking about these issues and planning, but young people tend to get in trouble catastrophically, traumatic accident or a sudden serious uh, illness. So it's just as important for them to complete advanced directives as everybody else. But I think the core target is everybody from about age 30, 35 up, because those folks are typically going to start dealing with these issues for themselves, but are, but are dealing with it with their parents and their grandparents. And so, it's not easy being the one to bring this up in a family setting. Um, if you have seniors in your family at advanced age, we're beginning to face the end of life, but we all have to do that. Be the one to raise the discussion. I bring it up at the gym, the supermarket, people talk to me. I'm always asking, do you have advanced directives? And, and again, you know, most people respond favorably to that. Sometimes they're a little, hmm, what, what are you talking about? But then when they listen, they go, you know, I'm gonna, take that seriously. And that's really what uh, preparing for a better end. Can I pitch the book site website, thebetterend.com? And it got great reviews from diverse people, uh, distinguished, famous people um, as well. You can see that on the website, thebetterend.com. And the book really is a service to, to people to think about it. It's a guide to helping them think through the issues and make sure they've thought through them, know where they're coming from. So I think it's been a tremendous service and, and it's well-written. Let me just make one other point that um, the, the issue of the minority health disparity, based on the studies we did at Hopkins, we identified this as a minority health disparity, meaning typically African-Americans, but other minorities just hadn't complete the rate. There's a distrust of the healthcare system to some degree within the minority communities for legitimate and historical reasons. Um, I've done a lot of presentations in minority settings and I've tried to make the point that this is about empowering you within the system. Don't let the system push you around. You can take a big step here. So it's another aspect of this uh, issue that I think is really important. Another just thought, where do people keep their advanced directives? You said not to keep in the safety deposit box, that it's a living document, a living discussion. Where do you keep yours in your home? Well, I'll tell you how it works in my family, okay? So I have three adult children. Um, they lived in, live in different states, or at least when we last completed our advanced directives, they did. One now has moved back to, to Maryland where we live. And uh, we also, I had all, from different states and from their different states, we sat around, had a really interesting family discussion about our values, all completed our advanced directives. Then I scanned them all, copied them, sent them to everybody. My primary care doctor uh, has it. Um, I have my QR code for mydirectives.com. Uh, I make sure it's in my medical record. 
um, and I have a, a medical go bag sheet of papers actually that I have in case I ever have to be rushed to the hospital. I know as an ER doctor, we're often spending time hunting for information. So that has uh, some medical history, the medicines that I take, a copy of my most recent lab test, copy of my most uh, recent electrocardiogram. And if I have to go rush to the hospital, I'll grab that and hand it to the ER doctor. So I try to make it as available as possible within the system. It's not ideal yet. The system has to change a little bit more to make this um, as readily available as my blood pressure and temperature and pulse, uh, but we'll get there. But um, be, being someone who I've also seen the, the value of an advanced directive as a clinician, can I share an anecdote? Yeah. Where, where my mind changed on a lot of this was many, many years ago and I was a, just, just a couple of years out of training. And uh, this elderly woman was brought in with a uh, clearly a major neurological catastrophe. We did all the workup. She had a serious uh, bleeding inside her head and there, for which there was no recovery. And as the family gathered, I could see that as when families do gather, a lot of tensions coming out and anger and issues between them. And uh, to make a long story short, she did have an advanced directive and I went to the room and they were all hell was breaking loose. And finally, it was my turn to say something. And I said, look, her advanced directive says, if I'm in an extreme state and there's no hope of recovery and mental function, which there clearly wasn't, we had consultations and all that done. Um, you know, I want to allow natural death. Just, I don't want heroic efforts. They might, and I read that and I shared it with everybody. And I said, I'm going to go in the room and I'm going to disconnect her from the ventilator, disconnect the medicines and, um, and, and you're welcome to join me uh, in that come to the room with me. You might think it might, I thought this is gonna get more explosive, but actually everybody calmed down. The family came together, the burden was lifted from their shoulders. So we went to the room, I did the medical things and drifted to the back of the room and watched. And the family came together at the head of the bed and whispered in her ear, said their goodbyes, told stories, maybe said a prayer, sang a little bit. And she died comfortably uh, in the next couple of hours. And, I, and, and that woman, I thought, you know, she really taught me a lesson. An advanced directive is not about me. We're a very me-oriented culture because if it becomes operative, you're, you're not making the decisions. She gave a gift to her family. Her actions kept her family together. And I think you and I have both seen, and every clinician I've talked to has seen families break up over these issues. The Terry Schiavo case, which was very famous, was a close-knit family till her husband, which when Terry Schiavo became um, seriously uh, ill and uh, you know, non-functioning mentally at her uh, parents, they, they were in huge court fights over national court fights over this. So it's really about if we say we love the people we love, we'll take care of them by taking care of this fundamental responsibility, which ought to become as routine as um, paying your taxes or renewing your driver's license. That after that shift, the next day I went to Shelly we just had one little baby child at the time. I said, we're completing our advanced directives now. And we did. And that woman changed my life. I never got to talk to her. I never knew her. But her actions showed, demonstrated to me the benefit of advanced care planning. That's great. And your book will help people do the same and, and lead them through it. That's what I hope. Any final comments? I realize that this is often an uncomfortable topic. We should just admit that up front. As much as I talk about it, I'm always edgy because I'm human and mortal too. Um, but let me assure everybody, if you tackle this, it doesn't take that much time or effort, um, you will feel better afterwards. It's like learning any new thing. Learning to drive a car seems so difficult at one point, and then it becomes routine, doing other things that we do that seem so difficult. And then you do them and you say, what was I fussing about? What was, what was the hang up? What was the problem? Um, we're aversive to talking about this. It's a taboo topic, like some of these other things that we now are com getting more comfortable talking about. And when we become more comfortable, we realize it's, it's something we can manage better and we feel better about it. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us about it. And thank you for writing the book. It really is a nice guide and it'll be very helpful. Thank you, Tyler. Great to be with you. You want to stop cloud recording? Yes.